This lesson deals with resistance and Ohm's law. You can find these notes in the course ebook in chapter 2 starting on page 16. Let's define another two terminal element called a resistance. Label the voltage across it, plus and minus. Then define the current as entering the plus terminal and leaving the minus terminal. In other words, a passive sign convention absorbing power. If you measure the voltage given a current, there's a relationship that relates the two, and that's at V is equal to I times R, and this is called Ohm's law. If you solve for I, it's V divided by R. If you take the second equation and plot it, where the y-axis is I and the x-axis is V, you get a straight line passing through the origin with a slope of 1 over R. R is called resistance. And if you take this last equation and cross-multiply, you get that R is equal to V divided by I, so the units would be volts per ampere. Well, that's a mouthful, and so they renamed it after the person who discovered it, whose name was George Simon Ohm, who is called Ohm or Ohms. Now sometimes the resistance is very, very small, and it's convenient to use this second equation and to find another term called conductance. Conductance is going to be the reciprocal of R. And so the units would then be amperes per volt. And again, it's a mouthful. So it's been renamed as Siemens, named after Ernst Siemens, an inventor who started the Siemens company, which is a large telecom and electronics company in Europe. Now the symbol we use for ohm is the Greek character omega, and since conductance is the reciprocal of resistance, we use the reciprocal of the symbol for omega. Now some engineers don't use the word Siemens, but actually use a term called Mohs, which is ohm spelled backwards. So you might see it either way, as Siemens or as Mohs. But again, the symbol would be the reciprocal of the omega symbol. Let's revisit our definition of power and relate that to Ohm's law. So power is voltage times current, but with Ohm's law we know that V is equal to I times R. Power is voltage times current, but it's also I squared R. We take the second form of Ohm's law and replace I by V over R, we get V squared over R. So the power absorbed in a resistor can be found three ways, the voltage times the current, I squared R, or V squared over R. Sometimes one of the three equations is easier to use because we already know one or two of the variables. What's interesting here, though, is because there's a square for current and voltage, the resistance can only absorb power, can't generate it. Now, resistance is the ideal concept in Ohm's law. There is a thing called a resistor, which is the actual device. Resistors can be approximated or really modeled under many conditions as an ideal resistance. Typically, they're made out of carbon, either carbon composition or carbon film, usually in cylindrical form with multicolored bands painted on them. It indicates the nominal value. We'll address this in the lab part of the course. The physical size of the resistor is proportional to its wattage ratings. So the bigger the resistor, the higher the wattage rating. So we have to calculate the power dissipated in the device to make sure that we stay below its rating. Now, although I've distinguished here between a resistor and a resistance, many engineers just call them both the same thing, but really they are quite different. We'll learn later that a real resistor can be modeled with an ideal resistance and other elements. We'll do the same thing in electronics too. Let's do an example of calculating power dissipated in a resistor whose value is 180 ohms and with 12 volts across it, but its physical size is that of a quarter watt. This is very typical what we're going to be using in the lab part of the course. Let's draw a schematic symbol here. I've got 12 volts, 180 ohms, and a quarter watt. Since I know the voltage and the resistance, let's use V squared over R as our formula for power. 12 squared over 180, and that's 800 milliwatts. But this is a quarter watt resistor, which is 250 milliwatts. We're more than three times the value of this in our resistor. What's going to happen? Well, if you wait a few seconds or even a few minutes, it'll get hotter and hotter and hotter, and it will probably melt or, worst case, burst into flames. Once this happens, of course, you can't use it again, but if it didn't, melt and you let it cool down, the nominal value would most likely change and you have to replace the resistor with another one. Now there's two very special cases of resistance. One is when the resistance approaches infinity. We show this as a symbol with a broken line indicating that the current is zero because the current is the voltage divided by the resistance and if the voltage is finite, well then dividing by infinity gives you a value of zero. Now, if the voltage is finite, then we can't calculate the voltage because we have something divided by infinity. So the voltage is actually unspecified or really arbitrary across an open circuit. Now, we can also sketch this like we did a resistance, I versus V. Any value of voltage, we have zero current. The voltage can be positive across an open circuit, it can be negative, or it could be zero. A short circuit is just the opposite. Symbol is just that, it's just a piece of wire. Here, the resistance is approaching zero, so using the first form of Ohm's law, we have I times R, but if R is approaching zero or is equal to zero, then the voltage is zero. 
So as long as the current is finite, then anything times zero is zero. And again, the value of current would then be arbitrary or unspecified in a short circuit. If you plotted the current voltage plot, you would now would have a current that's positive or could be negative or could be zero for a value of zero volts. And these are some of the properties of resistance in Ohm's law.